So um, I, I've been involved with genetically monomorphic pathogens for about 14 years now. And uh, I stumbled onto them by accident. Um, at the time, I assumed that any self-respecting bacterium would have genetic diversity. And we had just set up a method of looking at population structures and genetic diversity by sequencing a few housekeeping genes. Um, and as just out of curiosity, I decided to look at Yersinia pestis and sequence a few housekeeping genes and found no genetic diversity at all. Um, and at the time, this was a challenge because um, the first genomes had just come out and it was a major task to do one genome. And here, if you didn't have genetic diversity in a few housekeeping genes, you couldn't really do very much. Um, so it became a technical challenge. With time, it's turned out to actually be a technical advantage because with the advent of um, next generation sequencing, now genomes are easy and these bacteria um, have population structures that's particularly simple to understand as opposed to um, bacteria that are more genetically diverse. And there's a large number of these genetically monomorphic pathogens around. Um, so I, I wanted to summarize what we had been doing with genetically monomorphic pathogens. Um, <coughs> and, and one question, or one immediate postulate, when you don't see any diversity, is, well, maybe it's just oh, so... I, just I think people at the back might have difficulty hearing you, so it probably is worth putting the road, that mic on. Sorry. I'm not going to go back and say all I said before. If you missed it, you missed it. Um, so one of the obvious uh, explanations for uh, genetically monomorphic pathogens is they're just very young. If something were born yesterday, it won't have many mutations by today. Um, but the question is, how young is young? And very few people have actually looked until recently um, at how old things are among bacteria. Um, so one of the things I'm going to have to talk about is age. And when you're talking about age, you're talking about when, so dates, and then molecular clock rates, because that's how uh, you determine age. Um, you start talking about who, you talk about which lineages exist, which populations. So you start doing surveys of global diversity. And once you get into that, you get into where are they, how do they move, and something called phylogeography, which is linking geographic locations with past history. And, and then you start getting into the final topic, and I'm going to be coming back to this again and again. And this is, what is it actually in the genome? Um, and how is it changing? How are these mutations um, surviving at all? And I think this is time to say something about Darwinian selection. Um, I suspect all of you uh, are Darwinians or neo-Darwinians when you think about it. And in fact, um, it's almost a religion now, biologists. Um, and th this is, I think, a little question that when you're looking over a long time scale, you can see signs of selection. But it's not as obvious that you see Darwinian selection within species, uh, of bacteria at least, um, and that's something I'll be coming back to. I've seen very little signs of Darwinian selection. So when we talk about when, this is a non-Darwinian. Um, in fact, this date of um, 4004 BC is still believed by um, a number of creationists. 
And um, that's impressive. Somebody came up with a date estimate in 1654, and now 360 years later, it's still gospel. Uh, I suspect not many of you here believe it. But the accuracy is well beyond, sorry, the precision, not the accuracy, the precision is well beyond anything we can do today. He actually said it was on the night preceding Sunday, uh, the 23rd of October, 4004 BC. That's the start of the Michaelmas term in Cambridge. Pardon me? That's the start of the Michaelmas term in Cambridge. You think that was, uh, uh, but that. Cambridge didn't exist 4004 BC. I don't know how he chose it. Um, so I don't think any modern biologist can be that precise over a period of 6,000 years. Um, so let's look at what modern dating estimates are. And the Earth at 5 billion years and multi-drug resistant staph aureus at 30 years and there's a wide range in between. Um, I'd like to point to um, even our humans are um, only about 200,000 years old. And the question is, where do the bacteria lie on that range? For many years, since the mid-1980s, uh, a universal clock rate that was postulated by Howard Ochman has been almost as gospel as uh, Darwinian selection. And this was based on this straight line correlation uh, up here versus geological times of different uh, splits uh, between um, bacterial phyla and families. Um, and it looks like a straight line. So based on that, there was a universal clock rate, which applied to ribosomal, uh, to DNA encoding ribosomal uh, uh, RNA and to uh, protein encoding genes. And people have used this again and again, including myself, and one result of using that clock rate is that everything is very old. Um, now, the problem is we have changed our mind on when these geological periods were, and it's no longer a straight line. So there is no universal clock rate. On top of that, Howard found about 2000 that um, the clock rate differed between ribosomal RNA and protein coding genes. So you couldn't even go from a clock rate based on our ribosomal RNA over the clock uh, to uh, um, protein coding genes. And the final thing is that it varies from organism to organism and with time within organisms. So we have a problem. If we look at a recent estimates of the mean clock rate, so this is per nucleotide per year, we're ranging from somewhere around 10 to minus 6, or even faster, down to about 10 to minus 8. So that's um, about a hundredfold difference between the slowest and the fastest we know about. And when we looked at Helicobacter pylori, um, we were finding the clock rate over six months was close to 10 to minus 5, but over 100,000 years, it was more like 10 to the minus 7. And this is predicted by theory because purifying selection will remove deleterious mutations with time. And so the longer uh, things uh, go, things that happen, the more mutations are removed by purifying selection during genetic drift. Um, so you can't any longer just take a clock rate that somebody else has determined on some other organism and just plug it into your data because it may well not apply to uh, what you're looking at. I was just starting to talk about variable clock rates, and we're seeing this again and again. They're often observed in various genetically monomorphic pathogens. Um, one way to find out is there's a program by Andrew Rambo at uh, Edinburgh University called BEAST. And this gives you the option of having a fixed clock rate or a, a relaxed clock rate. And you can do log likelihoods and determine which of those is more appropriate. And almost every time what comes up as being appropriate for these analyses is the relaxed clock rate, which is basically a variable clock rate. Um, so the question is, why are they variable? What effects do variable clock rates have on genealogy? And one thing we got into, and I'll be showing this later, 
is we think that one of the factors that affects clock rates in epidemic organisms is that epidemic expansion and pandemic speed, uh, spread actually change both the genealogy and the clock rate. And that these are intimately linked to things that happen during a rapid uh, local expansion. Um, the effects on the genealogies are more likely to be um, that the branch lines you calculate are not uh, accurate. And why they're variable, uh, we don't know. So implications are that you can't use one clock rate for all microbial species. Another implication, because of these differences between short and long-term clock rates, is you cannot use an interspecies clock rate, which is what Howard Ochman has set up, based on when Salmonella and Escherichia are separated. You can't use an interspecies clock rate for dating within a species. And we would like to know what the evolutionary and biological reasons are for the variation of the clock rate for short-term versus long-term. Um, and demographic variation I'll talk about. And the final thing is you can't really trust any phylogenetic tree that is based on a constant clock rate. To put this into normal English, if you do a neighbor joining tree, that assumes a constant clock rate. So you can't do a neighbor joining tree and believe any of your calculations on the lengths of the branches if the clock rate is variable. And that makes life more complicated. I'm now going to leave theory and come back to um, observations. Um, I'm going to start with these things that have to This is disease for historians because it's killed lots of people and had major effects on European society and for necrophiles because it's sexy for them. There's been three clear pandemics caused by um, the three clear pandemics of plague. The first one started in the Justinianic era, 541, and went on for 200 years. Um, it seemed to come from somewhere around uh, modern Egypt, spread to the center of the Roman Empire, which was Constantinople at the time, and then um, uh, all over Europe. And it came in waves uh, for example, the first one was three years. That's how long it took to get all over Europe, and it kept coming back and forth in successive epidemics. And then it went away. And I, I think what most fascinates me is the question, why did it go away? Why did it stay there? Where was it doing in between these epidemics, and why did it go away? And we see this again and again. So the next one starts up in 1346, which is now the Black Death. Inside of a couple of years, it's reached uh, England, spread all over Europe, and killed about a third of the European population in the first few years. And that came back in successive epidemics um, until the early 19th century when it was still up in, uh, in Russia, and then it went away. And the most recent one started in Yunnan province in central China on the mid-19th century, got to Hong Kong um, by the end of the 19th century, and then spread by marine shipping all over the world in the few years after 1894. Being the first time that these bacteria were introduced to Madagascar um, on a ship from India in 1898, the first time it reached North America on a ship from Hawaii in 1898, as well as other continents where it didn't establish. But it did establish in Madagascar and it did establish in New York. Um, I was amused in reading a book from 1881, which is fantastic reading. Um, because it's pre-bacteriological um, era. It's pre-Koch. And somebody is talking about epidemiology at a time when there are no telephones, no telegraphs, no internet. And I had anticipated that the level of knowledge would be minuscule in comparison with our modern levels of information. 
Instead, this book has one chapter after another of details on outbreaks and epidemics all over the world. One chapter for plague, one for cholera, one for uh, meningitis, and on and on. There's three volumes in this book, 1881 by Hirsch. And one of the things that Hirsch says in 1881 um, is he does not believe that plague, which is present in India, um, is related to the Black Death. Um, because um, although the symptoms might be similar, it is a non-contagious disease. And um, doctors and nurses in Indian hospitals do not get infected from the patients that come in. And of course they don't get infected. There's no fleas in there. Um, but this argument of is plague, modern plague as we know it, uh, have, does it have the same etiology as the Black Death and the Justinianic has continued since then and through to modern times. And there's some very erudite books by historians bringing up one, and epidemiologists, bringing up one argument after another why ancient um, plague is different from modern plague. And among other things, the epidemiology is totally different. There's no way the modern plague spreads as fast as it did during the Black Death. Um, a second feature is the features of modern plague in India and other areas, for example, association with uh, house rats, um, were not present in parts of Europe uh, at the time uh, of the Black Death. There were no rats in, in, um, uh, part in, in Norway, for example, or in Iceland, but they had plague anyway. Um, there's been suggestions that ancient plague was associated with human flea uh, rather than with uh, rodent fleas. Um, but the modern epidemiology of disease spread by human fleas doesn't match it either. There's a whole number of things that are wrong. And on top of that, if you look in detail at the symptoms described in historical manuscripts, and Sam Cohn Jr. in uh, Glasgow has done a very good job of this, it doesn't match modern play. So it's almost amazing to me that um, Michel Goncourt showed in the late 90s that he could do ancient DNA from tooth pulp of skeletons and do PCR reactions and find Yersinia pestis specific sequences. Um, and he didn't find it in every skeleton or in every tooth, but he kept finding it again and again. And this has now been confirmed independently by other people. Um, so there's definitely uh, some um, Yersinia pestis in the Black Death. And just this year, there's a totally convincing study by um, um, Harbeck et al. Uh, showing the same thing for the Justinianic. Um, and it's been able to map those genotypes onto the modern genealogies that I was developing, and they've even done a genome uh, a couple of years ago from uh, Smithfield Cemetery in London from 1348. So there's no question now that Yersinia pestis was there. We know the genotypes of the bacteria that were there, <coughs> and the number of positive identifications of Yersinia pestis in these ancient skeletons is high enough that it was probably a large proportion, from mass graves, that it was probably a high proportion of um, what killed people with plague in Black Death and possibly the Justinianic. It was there, but we don't know the epidemiology yet. <coughs> to do our genealogy, we needed to determine a clock rate. So I'm coming back to how do you determine clock rates. I've already told you the Madagascar was infected in 1898, and again, repeatedly until the early 20s. But disease first took off in the highlands in 27. So the modern bacteria that are there arrived between 1898 and uh, 1921, not 27, sorry, um, and 1921. And since then, they had continuous plague in the highlands and have not rivers. It's transmitted by rats in Madagascar. This is the genealogy we came up with based on mutation discovery. This is the genotype of uh, a strain from India. 
and you have a blue cluster and a red cluster. Blue is all over, red is down here where it started in 1933. Our oldest isolates here are from 1926 and here from 1939, and they go forward to 1998. And from this, we were able to work out an endemic mutation rate. Um, and then we use that to uh, calculate dates from genomes. So these are 19 genomes. Um, we had about 1,300 SNPs in those 19 gen 17 genomes. Um, and uh, we calculated this group here is the group of bacteria that are responsible for the third pandemic. They're called 1.ori. This group here is what is found in Western Asia, Kazakhstan, Turkey. Um, the Black Death genome map right here on the beginning of that branch, which is called branch one. And the Justiniana that was done this year maps down here. Um, the dates on this are according to that endemic mutation rate. Um, and similar dates were obtained by using 1348 to fix it, plus many more genomes in another paper of ours. So I think the dating here is um, reliable. It overlaps with the Justinianic, and we put the end of the most recent, recent common ancestor as 3,300 years ago. So, when I say genetically monomorphic, its mutation rate is slow enough that it's only accumulated a couple of thousand SNPs over 3,000 years, which is not a lot of diversity. And this is because the pestis clock rate is so slow. In the more recent paper I was talking about, this is a tree, same sort of tree you saw, except it's a minimal spanning tree now. Um, this is the root. Um, it's done on 130 genomes now, most of which are from China. And the reason I think this is important is because our data shows that plague originated in China and has spread from there on repeated occasions again and again. Not just the Black Death, not just the Justinianic, but uh, basically always evolved in China. And within China, these are the locations of the organisms that we're looking at the genomes on. And these gray lines are major trade routes. These two are the Silk Road going to uh, Western Asia. These two are the Seahorse Road going down to India and uh, to Vietnam. Um, and most of the modern isolates in, in looking at Yersinia pestis in wild rodents are right along those trade routes. And so we think that probably the trade routes were involved in these repeated episodes of spread. And these are just some dating estimates um, all within that tree. This is another picture of these trade routes. Uh, so I showed you the beginning back here, and then the end, and those Silk Road lasted from about 200 BC to 1400, uh, sorry, yeah, from 1400 AD. Um, and this is where we're finding these branch uh, two isolates today. Now, where we get a lot more precise is in reconstructing patterns of spread during um, the most recent pandemic started in 1894. And uh, one reason is that every, every place we look at, we find individual nucleotides that are different, not many. We find a few nucleotides that are specific for each location. So we can distinguish multiple different branches summarized here in, in color. So for example, there's one branch going from Hong Kong to um, uh, Vietnam, going round and round, and Burma. There's another one going to Calcutta, and an independent one going to Bombay. And all of this is about the same time period. So that's a blow up of this region here. That one that went to Calcutta is also the one that went to Hawaii and then to the US. 
and has now colonized half of India. This one to Bombay is the parent of the one that reached Madagascar that we were just talking about. And then we've got others in South Africa and Western Africa and uh, um, South America. Um, so there's seven different routes here we we're able to distinguish based on the SNPs. And what was a lot of fun was being able to correlate um, these genetic differences, which are uh, indisputable, with historical records from the literature about how plague first arrived in Argentina and how plague first arrived in um, Hamburg, where we also have some bacteria, probably isolated from rats. They never got on land, but they found infected plague rats in Hamburg. And those are genetically related to the ones in Argentina, where boats carried it in from Venezuela. Um, so the third pandemic consisted of at least three independent major waves, and then these minor uh, things I was showing you, and India was visited by at least two of them. Pestis originated in China. It spread from there on multiple occasions. Now, the genealogy contains multiple polytomies. Let me go back. This is a polytomy. There is a point in this genomic tree in which branch three, branch four, branch two, and branch one come out from exactly the same position. Normally, trees are binary branches. That, that's what normal programs do, is they only give you two branches. And if there are multiple things coming from the same position, that program will give you a theoretical note further on. But here, when you're using a parsimony-based approach, um, you can actually see that it's a polytomy, multiple things happen at the same time. Um, and we see multiple polytomies in the Pestis genealogy. Here's one, uh, there's some more in here and up there, there's one. And we think these polytomies are signs of epidemics and outbreaks. So this one is associated with the Black Death, but many of the others do not have historical associations yet. Um, and what we think is happening is that during an outbreak, the number of effective generations per unit time goes up dramatically because it's spreading so fast in the rodent populations. Whereas between outbreaks, there are long periods of slow growth or quiescence. And that higher number of generations is accompanied by a larger number of mutations, creating a diversity that can then be fixed by drift. Um, so we think these multiple polytomies are associated with these rapid mutation rates due to faster growth and suggesting number of generations per year increases during an epidemic. They're also possibly a sign of epidemic and pandemic spread in general, although people haven't yet started to look at that in detail. Now, what surprised me, but I've seen it again and again, there are no signs of any sort of Darwinian selection. We're not even seeing many signs of purifying selection. We're seeing little signs of any sort of selection at all over 3,300 years. Except that deletions and IS elements are concentrated in terminal nodes, suggesting they've been lost uh, in the inner nodes, uh, suggesting they've been generated by continuously. So every time we look at an organism, we try to find signs of, of selection. The hardest to find, the ones we rarely find, are Darwinian but we're not even finding much uh, uh, sign of uh, purifying selection. So I'm going to show you one of the rare examples, which I think may immediately resonate with some of you, on where we do find signs of selection. And this is in um, Cerevar Typhi of Salmonella enterica. And after we had done uh, the first paper on Eusinia pestis in 99, uh, Gordon Dugan um, got in touch with me and says, why don't you do typhi? I said, why should I do typhi? Everybody knows it's uniform. He says, yes, but it hasn't been published at the sequence level. Um, and he persuaded me to look at typhi. And our first results um, showed exactly what I said, typhi is uniform. And then he got a Wellcome Trust uh, Fellowship back in the early 2000s and paid for Philippe Lumignac. 
um, who was a postdoc in my lab at the time, to look at Typhi in greater detail. And Philippe is now doing plant uh, viruses, uh, plant pathogens in uh, Montpellier. Um, so this project started with that, and then uh, um, people at Sanger continued it afterwards, particularly Cat Holt, um, who ended up doing some of the first genomes from uh, uh, next generation sequencing. And we got a lot of strains um, from Francois Xavier Weil, um, and an awful lot of strains from Vietnam from uh, Christian Dolich and Jeremy Farrar is now the head of the Wellcome Trust, apparently. We did mutation discoveries. This is pre-next-gen sequencing. Um, and um, again, this is a mineral stranding tree. Um, I had, didn't mention before, the size of the circles is the number of bacteria, the number of isolates. Um, the length of the lines reflects how many mutational changes. So a shorter line means probably one mutation here, and that would be two mutations. We're talking a total of 55 SNPs, or single nucleotide polymorphisms, that we discovered in screening about 200 kilobases of sequence. Uh, over, in the end, we looked at about 500 strains. Um, and the thing I want to focus on here are the colors. And these colors are mutations in the gyre A gene that reduce fluoroquinolone susceptibility. So red is this one here, a P83 mutation. And you see it here and here and here and here and here and here. No, that's a different color. Sorry. Um, along with white, which is wild type. There is no way that this is inherited because this is a purely parsimonious tree where there's been one cell that is the uh, ancestor of all of those, one cell that is the ancestor of all of those, one cell that is the ancestor of all of those. It did not have both a mutation in uh, jar A and no mutation. It had one or the other. Um, and what it looks like is that you had mutations happening in this gyre A gene here, but the ancestor of the next one was white. And it had new mutations. And the ancestor of the next one was white. And it had new mutations. And the ancestor of the next one was white. And some of those descendants had that same mutation, could have come from here, but others didn't. And this is telling you you have repeated independent mutations to fluoroquinolone uh, uh, partial resistance. Now, it's not the mutations are unusual, they happen all the time, but you normally don't see them because they're just overgrown by the wire type. To see this many mutations, this is because people are using fluoroquinolone. They're selecting out the rare individual bacteria that have those mutations through antibiotic usage. And they're doing this again and again all over. Um, I thought that was pretty impressive. So when we had a chance, we looked at it in greater detail. What I haven't mentioned until now is that Typhi is all over the world, but this group here, the H58 group, um, seems to have arisen even more recently um, in Southeast Asia. Um, and then has spread from there still more recently, in the last 10 years, to Africa. And this work now is done by um, Yachun Song. Um, and first thing, he develops a rapid SNP assay for JAR-A, JAR-B, PAR-C, PAR-E, which are two different topoisomerases. Um, JAR-A, JAR-B is one. JAR-A's and PAR-C, PAR-E is topoisomerase two. And these are the only known mutations in all four of those. And use that plus other SNP assays um, to look at um, all these bacteria in greater detail. Um, based on the genomic sequences that have since been done, he also identified 58 neutral SNPs that would subdivide H58. And these are showing you these mutations within um, jar A that I was already talking about and similar things to those. And he set up a, uh, a Luminex assay medium throughput, which you do 12 to 18 SNPs per assay, and you do about four Luminex uh, tests to do all of these SNPs at once. 
and that Luminex machine is part of the equipment that we brought with us in our setting up. And based on the neutral SNPs, the 58 neutral SNPs, this is H58 on about 500 strains, plus a few others of controls. And this is the root of H58, and it goes into two directions. So there's 458, 58 strains. And here is circle size. Our uh, two lineages. And now when we look at the sources of the strains, and we look at these different mutations I was telling you about, and you see exactly what I was telling you before, um, so let's start here, Southeast Asia. The ancestor was apparently uh, susceptible to fluoroquinolone. And here you got white again, that's susceptible. Here you got white, here you got white, here you got white. So what we're seeing is when you look at all four of those genes, you have an amazing mixture of mutations going on independently, but the next ancestor is susceptible. And that happens again and again. It's only out from here that you start getting into something which is inherited. So what I think is happening is that Typhi with fluoroquinolone resistance um, is less fit than its wild type parent. The one that multiplies and keeps growing is the wild type parent. But you keep selecting again and again and again. So the prediction is if you stop using fluoroquinolones in Vietnam, where a lot of these isots are from, it would disappear. Um, when we look at Kenya, um, these are the isolates in Kenya, and down here, both lineages were imported, and they have totally different resistance patterns to these um, um, uh, fluoroquinolone resistance. One of them came a bit earlier, one of them came a bit later. Um, this is the more recent one, so they're having troubles with fluoroquinolone resistance as well. And then South Asia, uh, everything we looked at, there's just lots and lots of fluoroquinolone resistance. Again, it's a mixture. It's hard to figure out what was going on there. So here, selection is working. The selection is human selection using fluoroquinolones. The bacteria aren't happy with it, but they're happy to respond by acquiring mutations. And that is the only really clear example I've seen until now on Darwinian selection. Um, what we're still seeing is the purifying selection uh, because they're less fit than the wild type and those mutations are getting lost. Um, the other thing I want you to notice is when mutations happen again and again and again, they're called homophase. So this is a technical term for repeated mutations. Now, homoplasies, turn it around. Homoplasies are a sign of Darwinian selection. When the same mutation happens again and again, something is selecting for it. So how often do we find homoplasies, except for the antibiotic resistance genes, in these genetically monomorphic pathogens? Almost never. Another sign that we're not seeing Darwinian selection. The third sign is very crude. This is the ratio of non-synonymous mutations, which uh, change protein uh, structure, to synonymous mutations, which don't. And those ratios are one in theory, unless there's some signs of selection. And in truth, these ratios are near one or just slightly lower in large numbers of genetically monomorphic pathogens. Saying again, we're not even seeing any purifying selection, loss of things that are less fit, unless it's very dramatic. Now, this is recent work by uh, Jermaine Zhu, who's sitting in the audience over there, was published earlier this year. And I, I want to bring, how are we doing on time, Mark? We've got another 22 minutes. Okay. So, um, I want to bring this in, because until now, all I've been talking about is core SNPs. So, these are parts of the genome that are present in all of the isolates that you look at. And this is the part that's easy to do. You basically take number of genomes and then strip out everything that is uh, variably present or absent and concentrate on what is left, and those are easy to do, and everybody's doing those. What is much more difficult to do with next generation sequencing is to look at the entire genome, the so-called pan-genome. The pan-genome 
consists not only of the core genome, but all of the variable DNA that is variably present. And, and now we've opened the Pandora's box. The variable part of the genome is the part that interests many microbiologists. So when we talk about virulence factors, or genomic islands, or bacteriophages, or IS elements, or transposons, antibiotic resistance, which is transmissible, conjugated elements, mobile elements, those are all accessory genes. And nobody's really looked at them in detail until now because um, it's not trivial to do it from next-gen sequencing. That's exactly what German did here, is he took these bacteria and didn't just do uh, core genome SNPs, but looked at the entire genome, reconstructed it, and then talked about what are the dynamics of what is going on with the core genome, which is very good for giving you your standard genealogy, and the whole genome, particularly the accessory genome, and how well did it correlate. The other thing he did here is uh, he managed to date how old the gona is, or at least the most recent common ancestor. Um, and for me, this is a beautiful example of something that is a recently emerging pathogen. Now, this is hype for many diseases. The Americans are wild about recently emerging pathogens. Uh, and I think it may be true on some viruses, although even there, I think it's more a question of spillover from bats to humans than it is of emergence. But you, you, you can debate that. Um, bacteria, I've seen very little evidence for recently emerging pathogens. Instead, I've seen evidence for poor epidemiology, lack of recognition, uh, geographic migration. In this case, I think we have a recently emerging pathogen, but it emerged since 1930s. So recent means 80 years. Um, so, Agona was first, I said, in Ghana in 52. It reached the USA and Europe and fish meal imported from South America in the late 60s. And it is since then one of the 10 most commonly isolated seropods. It is a common cause of, of food poisoning, gastroenteritis. And thanks to Mark, I learned that it infected 200 people in England and Newcastle uh, being infected with spices, which I didn't know until I uh, was told that by Mark. I got into it because um, I have long been skeptical about classical epidemiological, molecular epidemiology uh, used by the CDC in the US and large parts of Europe based on policy of gel electrophoresis. And I was talking to Martin Cormican um, at an ECDC meeting, and they were describing this outbreak coming from an Irish um, ready-to-eat food plant, and all of their data was pulse field gel electrophoresis, fingerprinted. Um, and so that was 2008. Uh, there were 200 cases, mostly Ireland, some in England. Um, and they had some cases of salmonellosis caused by agona in domesticated animals and humans in 2005 that had the same pulse field pattern. And they were uncertain. Are the ones from 2005 the same as the ones from 2008? And then there were other outbreaks that happened in Germany and the USA, but people were not correlating the pulse field patterns that well. So we decided to do a global survey. Uh, what you're seeing here is the core genome SNPs that I keep talking about. And here you see the pulse field patterns. And what I found very striking is that Germany was able to reconstruct these pulse field patterns from the pan genomes that he calculated, with only two or three minor exceptions. Um, and so what has been come been seen epidemiologically is that these here were one pulse field pattern, AGO X3, and that's another one, AGO uh, XB66, and so on. But if you look down here, these are XB66 as well. But they're far apart in the tree from those XB66s. So there are major discrepancies in relationship between looking at pulse field patterns, fingerprints, looking at the genomic genealogy. The next thing is that A1 here was this 2001 outbreak in Ireland, and A2 
is 2005 old Reagan animals, but they were different on pulse field time. And it was the A1 in, sorry, it was the A2 in animals that was the same as this crude outbreak down here. In contrast, bacteria from the wastewater, the food plant, had a different pulse field pattern, but are very closely related at the genealogy level. So um, this just confirmed my prejudice against PFG. I don't like it. Um, but the question is, why are we seeing these differences in PFG patterns? So let's go through this in a bit of detail. Um, what we have reconstructed is there has been a population expansion in the 80s and 90s, fitting with the importation into the USA and Europe in the 60s, and then subsequent decrease. And that the origin of um, all of the bone that we have is down about 1950. Um, there's two branches, uh, it's off screen here, there's two branches up here uh, that are very much older, but they haven't been very successful. Most of uh, modern gonas are concentrated in here. A gona is largely clonal. What that means is it accumulates mutations and has very little genetic recombination. Durman reconstructed those events of genetic recombination. Out of the 73 genomes, only five nodes showed any recombination at all. Most of those were on those long branches at the top you could barely see, and they were being imported from other salmonellas outside of bone. Um, and other than that, it was all mutations. So mostly, even though a third, two thirds of all the SNPs were due to recombination, the genealogy was quite easy to reconstruct um, because most of the mutations, uh, most of the SNPs were mutations. And now we come to the pan genome. These are independent introductions in those 73 genomes. A P2 like bacteriophage was introduced 25 times and lost twice. A TN3 ISL mill was introduced 19 times, lost three times. A FELS2 bacteriophage was introduced 17 times and lost twice, and so on. The PAN genome, the accessory genome, is highly dynamic. Unlike a SNP genealogy, where we're talking 800 SNPs total in 73 genomes that are mutational, the number of changes in the pan genome is dramatic, and this is why the pulse field patterns are different. Those pulse field patterns are reflecting these phages. These phages that are jumping in and out are changing the pulse field pattern because they're long bits of DNA with particular nucleotides, and when the same phage jumps into unrelated bacteria, it can give you the same pulse field pattern. If we now take that genealogy, now done in a circular form, just so it fits on the screen. This is the same genealogy you saw based on the SNPs, but now we're doing uh, insertions with solid lines like this, deletions with dotted lines, uh, here's some dotted lines. Um, red is an insertion element on a genomic island or a plasmid. Black circles are insertion sequences inserted in the cortex. And what you can see is they're jumping in and out, all over, independently. There's very little genetic signal in these. This is true of genomic islands in general, considering of phages. ICEs, we'll be hearing about from Esther very soon. Uh, plasmids and genomic elements as well, genomic islands, they're jumping in, jumping out. Um, and the correlations, what is correlating now is the accessory genes versus pulse field with an R squared of 0.4. In contrast, when you look at SNPs versus PFG, 0.13. The accessory genes versus genomic islands is quite high. The accessory genes versus SNPs is basically nothing. So you have two different genealogies going on, two different histories. One history is mutational genealogies that you can calculate easily. And the other one is all of this stuff going on, which I think of as selfish DNA. It's jumping in, it's getting lost, it's not doing any good. 
It's not bringing in anything useful. We're not seeing any cargo genes. We're rarely seeing antibiotic resistance. These things are jumping in because they want to jump in. They want to amplify their presence in nature. And they're not doing anything that we can see for the bacteria. Core genome sets are neutral, as are short indels. The accessory genome is chaotic, continue gain loss. Most accessory genomic items are present only very few strains. Selfish DNA, no signs that we need selection of cargo genes except exceptional strains of antibiotic resistance. There are also no universal features common to the outbreak isolates. We were comparing different countries, different outbreaks, um, disease versus environmental. None of it seemed to make any difference. It's whatever's around, whatever contaminates the food product that you happen to be distributing, that's what's going to cause an outbreak. We're not seeing any causality here. Um, and then all of the evidence is in indicating neutral microevolution or purifying selection of selfish DNA. So two take-home lessons. Comparative genomics based on a SNP genealogies is now fairly straightforward, and genomes are complicated. Thank you for listening.